Buenos dias, bom dia, good morning everyone. My name is Andrea Chmininsky Bigazzi and I have the honor of being the coordinator of Privacy Rules. Our alliance of legal, cybersecurity and crisis communication experts dealing obviously with data in the broader sense is present nowadays in six jurisdictions around the world. And I invite every one of you to visit our website in order to learn about the services that our alliance and all its members can provide all over the world and also to find the details of all our experts. Um, I don't want it to take much of your time. I'm not an expert in, in the topic of the webinar of today, FinTech in Latin American region. So in a moment, I will give the floor to our uh, chair of our Latin American committee, Stenla Vanegas Morales, in order to be the anchor of our webinar. Uh, I just invite all of you in the audience you know, to, to submit questions for our experts through the chat of this uh, of this um, uh, webinar, and I also want to inform you that in any case, this webinar will be also published in the future, so that you can receive not only the video recording of it and the podcast, but also some extracts that we can drive from the the the, the many uh, thoughts that our panelists will share with us, and in particular thank to all of them because they are sharing incredible knowledge about this, this topic with all of us and with all of you today. Stella, the floor is yours and thank you for being the anchor of today. Thank you, Andrea. Good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Stella Sofia Vanegas. I am the founding partner of Vanegas Morales Consultores, a law firm specializing in privacy matters based in Bogota, Colombia. The law firm has been part of privacy rules since 2018. And besides, I have the honor of being the chair of the LATAM committee, which has been preparing this event with the support of all the privacy rules staff. This event is going to be divided in two panels. The first one is called Agility versus Vulnerabilities and Private and Privacy Requirements. And the second one is Private Capital Investment Opportunities. Both of them are going to be led by two of our members of our alliance. We chose to talk about the evolution of the fintech industry in LATAM, mainly because this sector has been growing very fast and created high expectations regarding how to uh, act as a means to include more or uh, to include the population that right now is unbanking in our in our countries. Therefore, this sector has been in, has been managing significant amounts of personal data. Taking it into account, uh, we see that the fintech industry is facing critical challenges. First, I think is gaining and keeping the trust of the customers from whom they have been collecting personal data. Second, they have also to the risk to adopting new technologies, assessing the risks and also the chances of using them regarding privacy and data security. And third, adapting and enriching their procedures that are in connection with the processing of personal data. Allowing all allowing customers and clients to learn from it, also to be to gain criteria and building teams, minimizing the risks and empowering people to make the best use of personal data. Today we have a great group of speakers, and they are going to share with us their views on this field. Some of them come from the countries that are leading this industry in our region, such as Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia. And we have also the pleasure to have colleagues from Peru and Bolivia that are going to share with us their own views on this field too. So uh, I think that we are going to have the opportunity to learn from them three things, three important things. First, how the financial institutions are interacting with these new players. Second, that is very important, how the regulation is evolving. 
whether this includes privacy, data security, and cybersecurity. And third, how to continue growing without weakening the right of data privacy. Therefore, we have to continue joint efforts and experiences to consolidate the positive impact that this industry has in our economies and in our societies. I think I would like to add at the end some, a thing that comes from a, a, a feeling or, or something that I think from my point of view that is like COVID-19 brought us and I think an special advantage to let these new players to grow and to give opportunities to expand the benefits to gain access to credits in reasonable terms and with the agility that nowadays is required. I don't want to take more time from you and I will leave I would like to leave the floor to Mariano Perizzotti, who is going to be the person that is going to lead the first panel. Mariano is a great colleague, a great colleague, sorry, and a great lawyer. And he is also a member of Privacy Rules. So Mariano, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for leading this first panel. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stella. Thank you, Privacy Rules, for having me here. It's a pleasure to host this extraordinary session in which we will discuss privacy and regulatory challenges surrounding the fintech industry in Latin America. I'm partner at Ohambur Platform in Buenos Aires, who is a member of, the, of Privacy Rules. Uh, as you may know, privacy industry has faced an incredible development in recent years, particularly in Latin America. According to CB Insights, during 2021, investments in Latin America reached 9.8 billion US dollars, representing an increase of more than 200% over the previous year. But at the same time, we see privacy regulations in Latin America are evolving dramatically. In 2018, the Brazilian Congress passed the General Data Protection Law, and Uruguay amended its personal data protection law. Then, in 2021, Ecuador passed its first organic data protection law, as well as in the case of, uh, as well as in the case of, of several countries, as for instance, Panama, and recently we learned about Cuba enacting the first personal data protection law. Moreover, countries such as Paraguay, Chile, uh, Uruguay, uh, Chile, Argentina are discussing new personal data protection bills. Uh, this comes with a, a new trend on local authorities that are approving different regulations and guidelines that complement the federal data protection law. Due to the evolution of personal data protection in recent years, the conditions that a company must follow to process personal data, data in, in, in our countries have become more rigorous. The fintech industry must consider these new developments to properly comply with current regulations that and are at the same time conduct their businesses. During our panel, we will have the opportunity to learn more about different perspectives trends and challenges that privacy and other regulations impose to fintech companies in our region. We will hear the voice of outstanding experts in this field who will lecture on the best practices to address this evolving regulatory landscape. In that sense, it's a pleasure to introduce Lubica Bolanovic, founder partner of Bolanovic Legal Peru, Thais Garcés Lima de Mendoza, Head of Latin America Regulatory at Stripe, Ramon Ares, Managing Director of Whistlings Group, and Catalina Guido Español, Legal Director, FinTech and Innovation at Banco da Vivienda. And I would like to start with a question to Lubica. I think it will be very useful if you could somehow create a sort of legal scene for the audience and 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 I would like to, we would like to know what is the state of fintech regulation in Latin America, Yubika. 
welcome to the panel and and could you provide more information your, your insights about this yes sure thank you very much for the invitation uh, hi everyone uh, first of all i would like to introduce myself very quickly i am Lubitsa volanovic i am a financial lawyer uh, i have my own law firm which is specialized in fintech regulation and banking regulation i used to work for for many years the same as my partners for the Peruvian Superintendency of Banking and Insurance. There, we got all the, the knowledge of the regulation uh, applicable to the financial industry, which is evolving so fast. Uh, so um, uh, what we do is uh, we help FinTech that come to Peru, you know, FinTech companies that come to Peru to, uh, to start operations here, so to do business here. And also we help the bank, the banks in Peru, the main banks in Peru to uh, transform to do this digital transformation, uh, providing digital financial services. That is what we do. So we have this knowledge about the, the evolution of the fintech industry and the financial sector, actually, because everything uh, regarding financial services is transforming. So talking about uh, the stage of, of, of fintech regulation, I should say, because we, we see what is happening all along Latin America, that um, we have important advances I'm not going to focus only in data privacy, which is I'm not an expert in data privacy regulation, but I'm sure that every country in Latin America uh, has a strong regulation on data privacy because we follow in Latin America, we follow the European standard, the GDPR, so that's for sure. But talking about fintech regulation, I, I must say that we have key advances here. You know? For example, we have crowdfunding regulation, an important uh, fintech business. Uh, almost in every country, you know. We have it in Mexico, Colombia, Peru, soon in Chile, talking about open finance, which is very important because this is transforming the way we provide financial services, connecting through APIs every platform. So we have regulation in Mexico, in Brazil, and in Peru still, <laughs> but the Peruvian authorities are working very hard on it. We have sandbox regulation, an important tool to uh, prove innovation and to bring innovate, innovative services to the market uh, uh, and try them in a sandbox. This is a regulation that we have in Mexico, Colombia, Peru as well. And crypto assets regulation, which is very famous today, <laughs> uh, we have only regulation in Mexico. Uh, we should say that in Peru, the authorities are working nowadays in the, in the upcoming regulation on crypto assets, but only for anti-money laundering purposes. And finally, but not but very important, the cybersecurity regulation, which is very connected to data privacy. Uh, this regulation, the cybersecurity regulation, is present in all the time and is very strict uh, nowadays because of the pandemic. So I should say that we have important advances. And, and just to, to, to be clear here, it is not the solution to have a fintech law, yeah, because everybody asks me. Uh, why do we have a fintech law in Peru? Why do we have a fintech law in Colombia? The, having a fintech law is not necessarily the solution because not every single business in fintech has to be regulated. The purpose is to have these adjustments, to adjust the regulation that you have today to promote this industry, to promote innovation, but also to protect the public interests that are behind, like the data privacy, okay? So there is not a, the solution to have a, a fintech law. That is it, only to clarify. I, I should say so, Mariano, that's my answer. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And um, then let me uh, say hello to Thais. Uh, I will ask you, Thais, to uh, comment on your background, your expertise, and also to address a specific question um, and considering your expertise, could you explain the role of regulations in driving privacy compliance for fintechs? Absolutely, that's that's a great point. So, so to get us started, uh, I'm absolutely pleased to be here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I have a strong regulatory background in banking and payments here in Brazil. Uh, currently, I'm the head of regulatory for Latin America at Stripe. Uh, so, having said my background, let me let me address uh, your question. I I, I strongly believe uh, fintechs are very well equipped to to implement privacy by design. Uh, honestly, I think it comes with the DNA. Uh, fintechs are dynamic 
when, when it comes to deploying new applications and, and, and services. But at the same time, they typically hold and process large amounts of customer data. Uh, and, and in this context, innovation cannot come at the expense of privacy compliance. And, and fintechs are well aware of this. Uh, customers, they care about privacy, particularly when it comes to their financial information, and, and they are taking action to protect it. Fintechs, they can boost the confidence of customers by demonstrating good privacy practices. And, and, and that includes considering privacy implications at every stage of developing a new product or service, uh, being upfront about how they're processing customer data and promoting the extra steps they're taking to keep personal information safe. And, and, and this is why the concept of privacy by design has become so important for fintechs. The concept is that when building products, companies will do so by establishing privacy as the default setting. It is embedded into design. And, and, and therefore, they are being preventative instead of reactive. The principles of end-to-end -end security and, and transparency, which in, in my view are key to privacy, are being more valued than ever for the creation of customer trust. And, and this is not new for fintechs. Uh, again, that's why I say it is. it, it comes with the DNA. Uh, if they want to win customer trust and keep their products customer-centric, and, and, and therefore be able to compete with incumbents, privacy must be the norm. Uh, taking, taking the privacy laws seriously is, is a badge of competence that will make customers more comfortable when working with fintechs. And, and more than that, I, I don't think privacy uh, is just an obligation. Uh, it, it is a human right and, and a business imperative. Uh, for me, it's, it's clear that fintechs who own this view have a competitive advantage in respect of those who don't and, and of incumbents as well, of course. Thank you very much, Thais. We, we appreciate your insights on, on this specific topic. Uh, let's move to Ramon. Uh, welcome, Ramon, to our panel. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, as far as I understand, you have a, a strong uh background on on cyber security and perhaps you can uh comment on, on on your background and also uh just let us know about one one specific question we all have here is uh, what are the challenges to what challenges do fintechs uh, face around cyber security okay thank you Thank you, Mariano, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this group and present today. Uh, my name is Ramon. I'm a representative of, of this links uh, group in Brazil. Uh, we have a presence in uh, nine countries. So uh, in Brazil, in Latin America, I'm representing today for this uh, panel. And this is a very good question, Mariano, uh, nowadays. I'm just uh, listening to my colleagues that uh, spoke before me. Uh, some things that uh, is very uh, on the same way as security should be. Like Thais just said, uh, that uh, privacy by design. So companies like FinTech has to think uh, uh, since the beginning that uh, they must uh, do the, uh, the privacy by design. Security should be the same. So uh, we know that... Uh, Cybersecurity should be the priority for fintechs uh, because uh, there are many roadblocks uh, that properly secure application is a difficult thing to do. Uh, and uh, the, the type of company that is uh, a very uh, fast and uh, have uh, uh, you know lots of services that are digitally cheap that it, it's not compared to the existing ones, it may lead to security uh, breach. So, when we think uh, cybersecurity has traditionally uh, focused on securing the end, end product uh, through those of strong passwords, like in the past, encryption, multi-factor authentication, and secure logic, uh, uh, we fail on, on not only fintechs, but the fintechs because of uh, the rapidly uh, uh, and uh, strong uh, uh, 
uh, raise uh, technology in here. So applications were mostly tested after the release into the production environment, and this can be a risk uh, to the company and the user, uh, creating a, a very high uh, surface for attackers. Uh, so, like I said, security has to be uh, think about since the design application and use te uh, uh, techniques like uh, uh, secure development that uh, nowadays is being most uh, common used by these companies. So, because before uh, the developer used to do, uh, uh, you know, the best uh, use uh, friendly uh, application, not think security or privacy, whatever. So this could be a, a big uh, challenge for the application and uh, to protect the data that uh, are behind of this application. So I think uh, uh, we should uh, always uh, think uh, doing a, a high amount of uh, testing during the beginning of the application. So checking the, the logic application, the code, and also uh, has a strong uh, program to test and check periodically application uh, uh, to check how is the security uh, being nowadays. So we know new vulnerability, vulnerabilities appears every day. So if we don't want to have a breach on our services and application and expose the important and uh, data from the customer, we must test it uh, uh, frequently. Uh, you know, so because um, when a vulnerability, it it means that, that everybody on the security area knows that exists a breach that can be explored by anyone. So it uh, uh, it works like the vulnerability is identified. It has all the details of the vulnerability, the risk, and the damage it could create. So uh, the hackers and uh, the bad guys you try to explore, explore it as soon as possible because uh, they know that uh, there is a time to get there and repair uh, against these uh, vulnerabilities. So doing pen tests, uh, that's a, a kind of a test that you check how security uh, uh, simulating a hack attack can help you to find and, and, and correct this vulnerability before the hacker do. These are the challenges so that uh, you keep the security and check constantly your environment to see if uh, there are breaches that have to be fixed uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Ramon. You, you pointed out a very important issue that are the security incidents. We are seeing uh, a trend toward more, uh, more incidents that are faced by, by companies in the region particularly. Um, I would like to, to say hello to Catalina. Uh, Catalina, uh, uh, as, as far as I know, has a very, very strong and solid experience on blockchain and also privacy issues. And I would like to know more about uh, her background. Uh, but I have also a, a specific question uh, that is in, in the context of our discussion today. What are for you the main features of blockchain technology that makes uh, it attractive for for a data protection and um, and data privacy. Thank you very much, uh, Mariano, and thank you, Privacy Rules, for the invitation. I'm very honored and humbled to be here and to be on this panel with all these experts on the matter. Um, I am a financial lawyer that is enthusiastic about technology. That's why I ended up doing an MBA on MIT where I was able to, to know more about these new technologies firsthand. I work on Banco La Vivienda, which is the second largest financial institution in Colombia. And we are very well known for our innovative approach. And since we are an incumbent, we are not only working on like trying these new technologies, especially blockchain, we just issue a bond uh, using this blockchain technology, but we also work hand by hand with very well known fintechs in Colombia and in Latin America. So to your question, Mariano, blockchain, when we talk about blockchain technology, 
we talk about like um, distribute ledger technology that allows parties with no particular trust in each other, but that they share and rely on a set of rules that is called consensus. They are allowed to exchange any type of digital data on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. And actually it's the way the transactions are validated and recorded on the blockchain that make it especially attractive for data protection. Like, first of all, it is decentralized. So there is no central entity controlling the system, nor the data. Thus, there is no central point of failure and it becomes very difficult to attack. Actually, for an attack to be successful, you need to target the majority of the nodes of a particular blockchain simultaneously, which is very difficult, almost impossible to accomplish, especially on public blockchains. Therefore, because of this decentralization, the data is protected since a complete breakdown of the system is simply not feasible. Another char characteristic of the blockchain that makes it very attractive for data protection is that it is tamper resistant or immutable. This means that changes or deletions can't be made to the recorded data because they have already met the consensus protocol. Any attempt of changing or deleting the information will be noticeable for any participant and therefore will be rejected because that won't meet the consensus. Moreover, the transaction is time stamped and the use of the private and the public keys ensure the integrity and authenticity of the transactions. This leads me to another uh, characteristic and feature of this technology that makes it very like good for that for data protection and is transparency. Transparency comes because all transactions are visible to all the participants and any change, as I already mentioned, will be noticeable and rejected. Therefore, that like this makes it very good for, for protecting our data. However, it turns to be problematic somehow uh, because it, it, it proposed many challenges to data privacy. However, um, overall, the blockchain is, is very good and attractive to maintain this protection of the data that is recorded within it. Thank you very much, Anolina. Very interesting what you said. Um, I have a question to Lyubica. Uh, we recently learned some, about some technical, but also very concrete and useful insights in cybersecurity. Do you consider that regulators are addressing this correctly? I mean, the fintechs, the risk that that uh, using some technologies may may pose to to fintech models uh, and what it brings to the market. Uh, yes, I consider that the regulators are, are correctly addressing this risk. Uh, first of all, we have to, to, to mention uh, the risk that the fintech model brings to the industry because it definitely brings many, many benefits. No? We have a more agile and simple products no? for the users and, and we have the possibility to, to, to have all the, the services digitalized. So that is very important because Nowadays, for example, with the pandemic, with the situation of the pandemic uh, in Peru, we we have a lot of problems with the bank, with the banks agencies and uh, customers and citizens. Peruvian citizens could uh, couldn't uh, have their deposits on time, their funds on time, and there uh, we have uh, the opportunity to to leave the fintech industry there, you not know, the wallets and and all these initiatives that could. Uh, uh, bring many benefits to the to users, but also definitely these financial services, technological financial services, bring risk also if they are not correctly managed. Because in every single financial service, you have risk. Now here, the, the most important ones are data privacy risk, you know, and cyber security, money laundering, uh, operational risk, you no, know, and so on. So what uh, financial regulators are doing, and this is important, is that they follow international standards. Talking about Peru, the case of Peru, our financial regulator, the superintendency of banking insurance, always follow what is going on in Europe uh, when talking about um, regulation for financial services. No? Uh, for example, for data protection, for data privacy protection, in Peru we follow the GPDR 
and all the, the, the norms that surround this important uh, law. For money laundering, we follow the GAFI recommendations. Actually, we are working today in the new regulation for uh, crypto assets and crypto exchange following the GAFI recommendations. And there, for cybersecurity, we have a very strict norm today for the financial industry, which follows the ISO, you know, the ISO standards, all the family of the ISO. So that is very important because with the pandemic, we are more exposed to these uh, cybersecurity risks. And I should say that the fintech industry is also affected by this regulation because all of them, all of them, the fintech companies want to work close to the banks. They want to work in a partnership or they want to open a bank account or they want to work anywhere with a bank. So if the bank, if the financial entity is required to follow this strict regulation on cybersecurity, money laundering, operational risk, a data privacy regulation, for sure the fintech that is going to work with the bank has to follow this standard also. No? That is very important. So to your question, I, I, I consider that regulators are taking the correct approach you know, because they follow international standards and they are trying to supervise and be updated about these risks to try to manage them appropriately. Thank you very much. It's important to know that because uh, what we expect from, from regulators is that they do not pose or, or impose a kind of condition that make business impossible in our region, which is very, 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 very important for all the economy. Uh, then I have a question to Thais. You know, uh, privacy by design is something that is very important. I mean, all all the latest regulations around the world are including provisions requiring controllers and processors to take the necessary measures to adjust to and include privacy by design. Mm. But at the same time, it's also very it's a very demanding concept. Do you think fintechs are as well quite equipped to implement privacy by design concept into their product and services? That's that's a great question. Uh, and, and, and as I, I had said before, I do think they are. I think it comes with the DNA for effect. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting go, going back to and making the connection with, with your first question to me. Uh, I, I do think that while regulation will always drive, uh, it, it comes naturally to the fintechs because they were born in this new era uh, where privacy by design is, is, is so strong. Uh, I, I, I think regulation pushed fintechs into, into the direction of privacy compliance. Uh, shaping how they think about privacy and, and most importantly, how they embedded privacy into their products and services. So it comes naturally for, for fintechs, in, in my view, even more than, than for the incumbents. Uh, with, 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 with heightened regulatory and industry scrutiny of data security practices and, and, and more customer pressure when it comes to preserving privacy, uh, th those fintechs that take compliance seriously will stand head and shoulders above the rest, right? Uh, when, when you think of cyber breaches, data losses, um, missteps with regulators, they can be costly and impact fintechs in so many fronts. So it's it, for me, it's crystal clear that being non-compliant with applicable regulation is not worth the risk. Uh, a, a couple of things that come to my mind. Uh, legal fines and, and mandatory remediation processes required by regulators for continuation of operation, uh, reputational damage and bad press, uh, which of course can result in loss of customer and even investor trust. And, and as we know, fintechs are quite dependent on investor capital. Now think of how hurtful a privacy breach could be to an IPO. Um, I'll, I'll mention some interesting numbers here. Um, as we reflect on, on the protection of data. Uh, the, the World Economic Forum reported the pandemic led to a 50% increase of cyber attacks, uh, with 71% of security professionals reporting an increase in threats since lockdown started. Uh, according to Accenture, 
the average cost of cybercrime is 28% higher for financial companies than for other industries. Uh, when, when we see those numbers, for me, it becomes clear that fintechs need to be proactive to win in this environment with, with regular training, uh, solid privacy guidelines, processes and controls in place to protect customer data. And, and in that sense, I do think that they're doing a good job. They're, they're, they're in the right direction. Uh, and, and they are well equipped to, to compete in this arena with, with incumbents. Uh, I, I do think that regulation is driving fintechs towards that direction, but it, it, it comes with, with, with this new era that we're living in. Thank you very much. Uh, just one note, what, what, something that we, want, we, we would like to, to know is your comments and, and, and questions you may have you can leave in in the chat box you have there i think in on the on your right side of of the of uh, of this uh, your firm so uh, please uh, we will have uh, a q and a session uh, round of uh, of questions that we, you may we we would like to hear about your 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 comments and and and, and questions on that uh, but following um a, a, a question I have uh, regarding security and, and aspects surrounding cybersecurity is will be to Ramon. Ramon, you you commented something about uh, what a fintech can do in order to be uh, kind of prepared for a security incident. But um, I, I'm, I have no doubt that fintechs come with applications, and that's uh, one of the key parts of the fintech agility. How to mitigate fintech application vulnerabilities? Ariana, yeah, yeah that's a good question. I... Yeah, no, no, I, no, I was mute, but uh, okay. Uh, I think uh, there is an answer uh, wording that uh, are very commonly used in this area that when not if meaning that when uh, you get attacked by a hacker and, and, and the question is uh, if uh, because uh, these kind of companies are very connected to the internet you know so they are seen uh, as a possible uh, uh, target of attacks right so we know that, uh, uh, the companies uh, now uh, in general uh, of on this industry uh, has uh, took some tests on their applications and uh, and 97 percent of this financial application were uh, some uh, uh, big uh, uh, and important vulnerabilities in in the application that tiny you know very tiny so uh, and if you look at on the side of the hackers this kind of financial this industry are kind of a good spot for them because they, 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 they move a lot of money and has a lot of the important and uh, data that can be used for uh, transactions, you know, uh, and do get some uh, easy money for these attackers. So what a fintech business should ensure is a robust security measure, you know, by leveraging end-to-end -end security tests of the application this is a must you know you, you can't uh, just rely on that uh, uh, your developers did it uh, uh, good since the beginning uh, you know like uh, every uh, business uh, it changes from time to time I mean, every time they are uh, launching new uh, uh, new features on the application adding services and everything and this has to be tested again so it does not guarantee uh, what you did in the past is still the time, the current time. So uh, these uh, process are very important to this kind of industry, you know. And, uh, and, and regulatory, like some of my colleagues said, uh, we have on the traditional banks that uh, 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 force that traditional banks to do a lot of things to be protected. And then from the case that they are investing 
and uh, and uh, taking better a uh, and they on the fix that they are very new to this. Uh, maybe they are not so strong or strictly uh, required to follow this kind of uh, uh, regulation that would uh, support them more uh, uh, measures to, to guarantee the security. So again, uh, doing uh, regular tests uh, of uh, vulnerabilities, pen testing, checking the environment and the application, you know, every time we do uh, a new feature or provides a new service, it's a good measure to, to keep up on, on this uh, uh, environment. Thank you very much, Ramon. Um, I think encryption of identity can be a security safe word that individuals can rely on when using fintech platforms. Catalina, um, I would like to ask you the following. In your experience, what are the challenges that can be uh, to be addressed in order to allow the implementation of a full encrypted identity service on blockchain? Great question, Mariano. Thank you. Um, I, I think that before addressing the challenges, uh, we, we need to understand what privacy is made of. I think that privacy is a mix between confidentiality and control. Confidentiality as the protection of personal data against unauthorized uses and control, like as the ability for you to own your personal information and ensuring like the self self determination to know who do you give your information to or who is able to see your own information blockchain is very good at keeping confidentiality and data protection but present many challenges on the control especially regarding the possibility to erase or correct information that is wrong because blockchain is tamper resistant and thus is immutable the user does not have the possibility to go back and erase the data or won't be able to exercise the right to be forgotten. That is one of the principles of data privacy and is included also in the GDPR. So this makes it very difficult for, for actually the user to have that control over uh, its data. So the blockchain and in general, the fintech industry needs to move forward to allow people to own their digital identities in such a way that they can actually determine that even if the data cannot be erased, people can choose which data is shown and to whom it is shown. Uh, so this model is like the self-sovereign identity model and works through the use of public and private keys of authentication and opposes to the current model, which is the identity management in which a third party is actually the one who is authenticating the information and certifies the identity of the user. So, but the use of this encryption and the private and public keys is a challenge itself. Since users need to keep the keys safe using their cold or the hot wallets, and key management systems need to be improved so they won't be vulnerable to any attack. Um, so for to address these challenges, what is happening now, nowadays and is new, a new idea uh, emerging by uh, Vitalik Buterin, which is the creator of Ethereum in a paper that was released back in May, is the use of soul bound tokens. These cellbound tokens are, are an alternative uh, for sorting any personal data on the blockchain, but allowing to state the identity and reputation of an individual. So actually what cellbound tokens are, are similar to NFTs, but are not transferable. And you are able to identify an individual by the way, like this individual is part of several groups or communities that validate his or her existence and by representing its traits, features and achievements that makes like the identity of the person. That way, like you address the challenge of information being stored on the blockchain and that cannot be erased by having this soul bone token that actually helps to identify. So it is like uh, a step forward 
of this uh, encrypted identity issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very important all what you said. Um, we have two questions so far. The first one uh, about, uh, is from Eddie Marines. Hello, I would love to hear your thoughts on what thing fintechs need to keep in mind when working and offering services to LATAM countries. Um, very, very, very important question. It addresses a lot of aspects that were discussed during our panel here. Uh, 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 the first one I, I, can, I can say is that, well, you will have to keep in mind that there are many regulations that have been passed in, in Latin America and there are pending draft bills and bills that are being discussed in, in our countries that will, uh, I'm sure, will impact on the industry. But I don't know if somebody would like to um, focus on, on more information on, on, on this specific question. Okay. Sure, Mariana, I can. Okay. Uh, answering Eddie, it is very important to know the regulatory roadmap from every country, because even though we are similar in regulation, because we follow the, the, the same standards and, and, and principles, it is important to know deeply the regulation coming to every country. For example, in Peru, no, I should say, is it or is this operation viable? Can I can I do it? Can I do it alone? Do I need a license? Do I need an authorization? A previous one, or I only need a register? Those kind of things are the things that always ask us to me when they think they come to Peru, no? And then after you have this regulatory roadmap to know what exactly you can do and what you can't, then you have to know very, very uh, well the stakeholders that uh, provide the, the business, the financial business, the financial services in the country. Because why? Because you are going to need them. You are going to need a bank. You are going to need to approach the authority. You are going to need to be involved in, for example, the, the FinTech Association. You have to know them and you are going to be connected. So those two things are very important. And for sure, when, 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 when talking about regulatory roadmap, it is important for the fintech to implement the, the, the regulation, the norms, no? Because if, if there you see that you have to have an anti-money laundry system, it's because you need to have it right away. Otherwise, you are gonna, you're not going to be seen or you're not going to have any business without any bank. No? That, those kind of things are very important, the regulatory roadmap, no? Thank you very much, Lyubika. Uh, we have another question that will be, uh, what are the security measures fintech companies take to mitigate risk? Uh, probably Ramon will be uh, the best person to answer this, this question considering his security background. Sure. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think Sayed uh, asked the question, Sayed. So what's important? Yeah, uh, when the we know that the stakes of subject are higher than ever, so uh, what we need to do is uh, a strong measure by leverage to security of the application. So this has to be on, on the mind of the all the companies, especially on fintech companies, because they are a very uh, attractive uh, target for them. so we need the. Uh, uh, most of the time, we don't have uh, the specialized people and uh, analysts do the job. And and then uh, the best thing is to outsource to companies that are specialized on this kind of tests and uh, to have a, a very clear uh, measure and test of your application security so that you may check if there are vulnerabilities uh, and how compromise is your application in case of attacks. So, Keep in mind that uh, doing your security uh, evaluation is uh, the best thing. Thank you very much for this. I think we are run out, out of time here, so I have to close our panel. It was uh, very interesting to know uh, more about this and listening to all of you. You guys are uh, 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 expert professionals on, on these fields. Um, in my case, I learned a lot of, of, of privacy, 
fintechs and, and regulations. Uh, um, and now, well, uh, I would like to pass the word to Stella and, 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 and invite you all of, all of you to stay here and listen to all the, the great things that, uh, Luisa will, 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 will bring to us, uh, about the, the, in the next session. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mariano. It has been very exciting hearing all of these uh, conclusions and also recommendations from our panelists. I, I, I really I have to try to, to I, I don't know, to try to choose some ideas and I would like to, to choose many, but I think I'm going just to give three, three ideas in order to, to sum up. It is the first one, FinTech industry needs solid privacy and security guidelines. It is not just a matter of technology. It's also important training people to keep in mind that privacy is a fundamental right. And we have to follow a preventive approach. This is a must in order to try to avoid the losing or the misuse of the personal information. So thank you to all of you. And now I think it's time to hear the second panel that is going to be moderated by Luisa, a great colleague, wonderful woman that I really appreciate. And uh, I, I'm sure that she's going to lead this panel that is going to complement these first views and conclusions. And Luisa, well, I don't, I don't want to take more time. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Stella. It's really always so nice uh, speaking to you. And uh, well, uh, it is very nice to be here. And uh, the prior panel of our FinTech and Latin uh, event has been great. So we have now the, this big challenge of maintaining the high level of discussions. But I think we're going to be able to do that because of the professionals that are here with me today. I would first like to thank uh, Privacy Rules for inviting me to moderate this panel. Um, in addition to that, just for the technical team, I think everything looks so great. Uh, the background, good job, you guys. I would like also to thank everyone who took the time to watch us or listen to us. And of course, uh, our guest speakers who so kindly accepted to be here with me today. I really, really thank you. Um, and to uh, whoever is watching us, if you have any questions or comments, I invite you to post them to us and we'll be happy to discuss them uh, here. So, okay, so the subject of our panel is FinTech in Latin, Private Capital Investment Opportunities. So in recent times, the fintech ecosystem in Latin America has experienced rapid growth. It has doubled its size in the last three years, uh, according to a study published uh, this year by the Inter-American Development Bank. So according to the same study, nearly a quarter of fintech platforms globally are Latin American. Country distribution uh, in the number of platforms is still led by Brazil, my country, 31% of total, uh, followed by Mexico, 21%. Colombia, 11%, Argentina, also 11%, and Chile, 7%. Um, you know, I'm talking about Brazil because this is my country, and uh, I'm proud to say that Brazil has been an example to the world uh, of innovations involving uh, open banking, including the creation of the PIX. Don't know if you ever heard of it. Uh, it's an instant and free electronic payment, which facilitated the transfer of values and uh, completely changed the payment culture of Brazilians. I invite you all to come to Brazil to see the fix um, functioning. You're going to be impressed. Um, and also, a study conducted by Intet showed that 72% of fintechs in Brazil are developing solutions in line with regulations associated with the pick that I just um, uh, spoke to you, or the open banking. Uh, well, um, uh, Luisa Sato, and I'm a data protection and privacy professional. I'm Brazilian and very, very interested in the fintech market in Latin America, especially in the years to come. Uh, so it's pretty great to uh, have here with me today professionals that will help all of us to understand the scenario of fintech in Latin America. And well, without uh, further ado, I would like to start with Patricia, uh, head of legal at uh, Sparping. But Patricia, I would like to introduce yourself and also your, uh, your company. And uh, also, I would like to start with my first question, uh, which would be, why do you believe the, ad the adoption of digital assets has been so significant in Latin America? Thank you so much for having me. 
having me. I hope everyone is just, just let me know. My name is Patricia Kuchoy. I'm Brazilian in the UK for the past 10 years. I come from the finance uh, the, in the past few years. Uh, during I'm privileged to that regulatory change. And, um, I'm the head of legal at Parfum. I might be cutting off, off to some of Actually, the I'm videos. sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt you, but I think we cannot hear uh, perfectly. I don't know if it's the the uh, the earphones. I don't know. Yeah, maybe you could take them off. Let sure. me, if, if you wanna, uh, um, maybe just uh, the the order. If you can go to them, come back back to me. All right, we'll do that. Okay. Okay. So let's see who I'm going to choose from uh, everyone. Stefania, all right. So Stefania, um, you're the general counsel of ADDI. I would like uh, to let you introduce yourself and also um, ADDI. And uh, um, so my question to you would be, uh, what in your opinion is the biggest challenge you are perceiving for startups and FinTech in our region, Latin America? Uh, great. Um, of course, I will. Uh, thank you, Luisa. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and thank you for the private to the privacy rules organization for having me here. As explained by Luisa, I'm Estefania Molina. I'm Addis General Counsel. Addi is a fintech uh, founded in Colombia, currently based both in Brazil and in Colombia. So this is a very exciting um, conversation um, to have. Um, Addi is a fintech. Um, the way I mean. The way in which we frame our business is we power digital transactions for buyers and sellers um, in the region, currently in Colombia and Brazil. Uh, how do we do it? How do we think we will su succeed? By building the best and deepest merchant network, delighting our customers and merchant partners, and becoming the leading uh, PIX uh, provider uh, in Brazil. How do we do this? Through buy now, pay later, and buy now, pay now solutions. So that's basically uh, what we do. So to your question, uh, Luisa, of what are some of the biggest challenges we're facing right now? Um, it's difficult to, to choose, but probably um, some of the biggest challenges we're facing uh, right now come from the fact that uh, we are, um, the environment has changed dramatically uh, in the past few, um, in the past few months. So uh, right now, um, up until the end of last year, we were in a situation in which what capital was very uh, abundant in the market. And right now the, the, the tide has shifted, the macroeconomic situation um, has changed. Um, so of course there is the challenge of, of, fund, of fundraising, um, which in turn results in higher pressure to execute flawlessly, uh, to be honest, while keeping uh, growth. Uh, of course, there are tensions that arise from this, um, um, like relevant for these for this conversation we're having here. Uh, of course, there are some uh, there are some tensions that arise in terms of compliance uh, because growing and growing exponentially sometimes comes uh, at the expense of process building and compliance. And by the same token, process and yes, compliance sometimes. Uh, gets in the way of growth. So if you ask me, I think probably some of the biggest challenges uh, relate precisely to, to, to some funding restrictions around, to the fact that uh, the bar for execution has raised. So actually uh, you have to be very good at what you do. You have to make sure that you have product market fit. Um, you um, have to make sure that you do this in a context of compliance, uh, because again, this is a very, very uh, regulated sector and that you stay on top of the trend. So you were mentioning uh, you were mentioning picks, for instance. So how do you make sure that you stay on top of the latest regulations um, to make sure that you can actually deliver an offer that users will love, that they will actually use, that you will um, serve your merchant base, that you know your customers uh, good enough, uh, and then that you um, build products that clients will love, but then that are also um, compliant. Uh, but yeah, I, I, if you, I have to sum it up, I think the greatest challenge is uh, relates to the fact that the tides have changed. And while, yeah, there are a lot of uh, startups and, and, and fintechs uh, in the region, um, 
the environment has changed significantly in the in the past uh, year, so to speak, uh, and will be required to execute flawlessly to focus on profitability and on long term uh, sustainability. That's great. That's great, Stefania. You know, whenever you say that uh, those are the challenges, they make me happy in a way because, you know, it's good for us lawyers because we always have, um, well, we have more clients and more work because of that. But it's good because we always have to be uh, up to date with the new regulations. And in addition to that, a good thing for lawyers and all the professionals working uh, with this is that we have to get to know not only the legal and regulatory aspects of everything, but also the technical issues that um, invo that are involved in this. So yeah, it's a really complex uh, environment and uh, well, great, uh, love the list of challenges that you brought. Thank you for that. And Patricia, let's, uh, maybe we could uh, try again. Um, yeah, guys, I'm okay, so sorry so about that. Um, <laughs> is it better now? Can you hear me? I think so. I think it's better now. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Pachi, I think my question to you, I, I had to, to read it again. Uh, why do you believe the adoption of digital assets has been so significant in Latin America? That was the question. Sorry about the, the technical issue, but just going back. So uh, my name is Patricia and I'm in, and uh, Perfume is a startup that that was launched in 2019 and our strategy is to allow uh, where we provide infrastructure uh, market players to allow them to have access to digital assets on top of being able to manage uh, those um so in terms of the adoption of um digital assets like a quite significant uh, uh, growth in the past few years uh now is 10% of the overall global flow uh, of transactions in this digital Latin America. And uh, there are particular three reasons uh, that I think uh, and, uh, is, is so significant in Brazil. I mean, the first, and in Brazil and also, also other countries. So the first one is uh, uh, due to high inflation. So a lot of uh, want to be able to look uh for assets that would not be so volatile. We've seen um, a, a big part of the population looking to invest in gold. But now, because we have such a also large uh, young population in Latin, we see individuals looking uh, to crypto uh, and other forms of digital assets to have a more stable investment. The second one is a political instability. So also in Latin America, we see a lot of changes in government. And if you are uh, still like myself and, and, and Lou, uh, you can remember back in the 90s where uh, of a lot of the saving accounts, which was like a big shock for the population, really a hard time to, to go through for a lot of families. So now we have this new generation uh, some record of uh, what happened and, and because we're always changing government or some structure that will allow them to invest without feeling that those assets can be set at any time and the third one is uh, a lack of a uh, traditional big part of, of the population Latin America has quite concentrated market banking um, it's quite it can be quite hard to open account with those banks, high fees and lengthy process. So a lot, a lot of the population at then was what well, we but now we're seeing a lot, a lot of different initiatives and players bringing an easier access part of unbanked uh, population and also one of uh, these options in the digital asset space because you only need access to internet and cell phone is we do have a very high number of adoption and uh, of internet like i think it's 80 86 percent of the population has access to internet and cell phones now right 
Great, Pachi. Thank you so much. You're still cutting a little bit, but I, uh, but I, I think I managed to understand you. Uh, so just for for you uh, who didn't uh, quite follow, uh, Pachi mentioned the high inflation here in Latin America, the pollution, uh, political instability, and the lack of tradition in investing. And uh, the good thing about the digital assets is that uh, they're making it simpler for people to uh, invest their money, uh, especially, of course, uh, with the uh, with people accessing more and more the internet. So this is why the digital assets are becoming so important here. Uh, so thank you, Pachi, for that. And um, well, uh, now Santiago, of course, you're going to introduce yourself. And uh, we are at a privacy rules event, and I am a privacy professional. So I think I'm going to ask uh, to you, something related to that. In the prior panel, I love uh, what Thais br brought to us, um, that she uh, she was saying that privacy uh, gives a competitive advantage to fintechs, and I really, really agree with that. And I think it was great um, that she mentioned that. And, and for you, uh, now bringing it up to a country-based level, and you're in Argentina, and uh, you know here in Brazil, we always kind of envy Argentina because you have uh, a very good uh, privacy law and used to have it for, for years. Uh, but now Brazil also has a very good, strong law. So uh, maybe we can we can just uh, uh, talk about something else. So uh, my question to you would be, what are the main privacy challenges to implement an open banking initiative in Argentina? Excellent. Thank you, Luisa. Um, well, firstly, I would like to thank Privacy Rules and especially to Mariano Perusotti for inviting me to participate in this great event. Uh, it is always great to share a panel with such great colleagues, and I'm very excited to hear your opinions on the topics that we're about to discuss. Well, I am uh, the Legal Compliance and Government Relations Director uh, at Modo. Modo is a financial technology and payment plat platform, a property of Play Digital Corporation. Uh, Play Digital Corporation is a company owned by 32 banks in Argentina, including ma many local subsidiaries of international banks, such as, for example, HSBC, ICBC, BBUBA, uh, Patagonia, Itaú, Santander, and many, many others. Um, I think, Lisa, with your question, you just like took one of my catchphrases because I was also going to quote um, uh, Thais from Stripe because I was really moved by the way that she explained how companies should um, uh, see the compliance with the uh, privacy regulatory frameworks. Um, particularly, I think that in Argentina, an open banking initiative uh, has like two main challenges, right? The, the first one is the banking re regulatory framework, and the other one is the personal data protection regulations. In connection to the banking regulatory framework, one of the main aspects to be considered is the secrecy, bank secrecy. Um, this is a legal requirement applicable to mainly uh, to financial institutions, and it covers only the secrecy or confidentiality aspect of how information should be handled. And it contrasts to the right to informative self-determination that uh, is the one uh, that uh, rules for privacy regulations and aims to allow data subjects to choose when, how, for what purposes, and with whom to share their information. Well, regarding personal data protection regulations, and uh, as you all said, um, Thais was like a, 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 um, putting out the idea that the um, privacy uh, regulations com uh, compliance should be a business imperative for all uh, fintech companies. Uh, and I could not agree more with that idea. I believe that open banking has the potential to uh, truly empower data subjects to really decide what to do with their data, who should be able to use it, uh, for what specific purposes. Nevertheless, there are several, several challenges. Uh, and I don't think that uh, these challenges are really obstacles, but um, they are challenges um, notwithstanding. And to successfully implement an open banking initiative, the main objective should, to tackle should be to give clear and precise information to data subjects as to ensure that their uh, consent is really valid and well informed. As you may imagine, uh, it is not an easy task because um, we should consider that the average consumer is not an expert in fintech matters and by all means, uh, there, there are no logical reasons to, to expect them to be, right? Um, so 
both legal and communication teams for, uh, from every company should sharpen their creativity in order to ensure that customers are treated with respect as to their rights at all times, giving them the necessary information to let them choose freely. And this should not be, at least in my opinion, uh, performed by some, let's say, long and, 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 and tedious to read a privacy policy right a, or a consent that you should put agree or reject or customize cookies or something like that. Uh, um, but I believe that we should really make the effort to try to get to the customer, to the data subject in a way that they understand and they um, uh, really get the, 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 to the goal of being empowered to use their data for what they want. You know? And finally, uh, lastly, uh, cybersecurity is not a great issue to have in mind in connection to open banking initiatives, um, at least regarding personal data protection. There is a highly relevant concept in almost all open banking initiatives uh, around the world called strong customer authentication. It's one of the many concepts that any lawyer or any compliance officer should be aware of when talking about uh, open banking. This refers to the need to implement sufficient authentication methods in order to ensure that the user's identity is valid. At a very high level, most jurisdictions consider an authentication method to be strong when it combines at least two different factors from the three available ones, which are something I know, like a password, something I am, which involves biometric authentication, or something I have, which involves mainly physical devices such as cards or tokens associated to a specific smartphone. So mainly I would say in order to sum up that banking regulations are somewhat ready to welcome open banking, but personal data protection regulations should be uh, really challenge at least in Argentina because we have, as you uh, well said, um, a, a very strong law but a very old law, <laughs> which is uh, frankly outdated, uh, mainly in, in contrast with your uh, Brazilian data protection law, which is uh, very similar to the European data protection regulation. And uh, I think that we should put the customer or the data subject in the center of the of the scene in order to really address what they need to know in order to handle the, their data as they intend to. That, that, that should be the, the, the main driver for every company in Argentina, at least. Perfect, Santiago, that was great. That was a great summary. Here in Brazil, when we were developing the open banking, um, it was so complicated. Everything they were saying was considered and, and we had different phases. Uh, for the entire uh, implementation of open banking. And one of them referred exactly to the consent, how we are going to obtain that consent, right? Because the person cannot just click a button and, and think that everything is fine. The person has really to understand uh, whatever she's consenting to. So this was a very big deal here. And we were discussing, of course, prior to that, if consent would be the only legal basis that would um, permit uh, the open banking, the sharing of information. And then the conclusion was yes. Consent was the only legal basis. And we also had uh, the, the phase that referred to the information security measures because they were, um, we had to have uh, minimum requirements, minimum standards, but things are working out great. But we had the exact same um, challenges here in Brazil. So it is uh, really good to hear from you that uh, you're facing the same. Good. So now, Paula. My dear colleague, she's a member of Privacy Rules uh, for Bolivia. And uh, well, Paula, you know, a few years ago, um, I, was, I was already working with data protection and uh, Brazil didn't have um, a, a general data protection law or any law. We actually had um, like a few articles in different laws and it was really hard uh, to answer to, to questions from my clients because they were asking those uh, really uh, difficult questions on whatever uh, he or, uh, or she had to do with um, the processing of, of certain uh, personal data. And I really found it difficult because we didn't have a, a law that would give me the, uh, the precise answer to answer to that consultation. So I think you face the same there in Bolivia because as far as I know, uh, you do not yet have a, a specific regulation on data privacy. So uh, my question here to you would be, how, how do you do that, Paula? How do you manage data-related matters that concern fintech development and performance in your country? Thank you, Luisa. It's great to be here. Thank you for 
having me here and giving me the opportunity to share this session with all my colleagues and friends. Well, as you well said, uh, I'm Paula Bauer from CRNF Rojas uh, Abogados from the Bolivian Members of Privacy Rules. Uh, regarding your question, well, it's, it's really hard. I, I totally understand your position a few years ago. Uh, we're facing that uh, several years now. We do not have a specific regulation on data privacy. Uh, however, fintechs ha have been growing a lot uh, the past few years. We have seen this growth, uh, spe especially in the pandemic. With the pandemic, um, citizens and consumers have been using a lot of digital platforms and digital payment methods. Uh, we do have 152 um, startups uh, working in Bolivia, uh, which uh, 22 of them are specific fintech companies providing uh, financial services in, in technological platforms. Uh, we do not have a fintech law. However, we do have a fintech chamber uh, protecting and grouping all these fintech uh, companies. How do we manage to do that without a specific privacy law and data protection law? Uh, well, we do have scattered uh, regulations, uh, namely in the, fin in the fin financial sector. We do have a uh, law number 393 on the financial sector, which specifically regulates the handling uh, of uh, private, private information of customers and clients and the specific roles of uh, if, um, internal banking performance regarding that uh, information, private information and data privacy protection. Uh, we do uh, manage uh, to protect privacy of the consumers and, and users of the financial sector also under the umbrella of the constitution and other sectors, specific re regulations such as telecommunication law. Uh, so we can uh, say that fintech sector is not duly protected uh, and specifically protected regarding privacy data managing. However, we do have uh, fi fintech companies moving around in a loophole in a gray area regarding regulations of this sector. Good, Paula, thank you. So you have this additional challenge in your life uh, when dealing with fintech in Bolivia. <laughs> All right. So uh, I don't know if the audience uh, it's, it doesn't have uh, any questions, but if you do, please post it and uh, they will come to us so we can discuss here. But I think actually we um, the time really flew, really went by. And uh, what I, I will ask from you uh, is that uh, you if you have some closing remarks because, because we're almost at the end here of our panel. If you have one, two or three concrete tips that uh, for the companies uh, who are now following us or that are going to watch us, uh, uh, record it. Uh, so I think we should start uh, from where we began with Estefania, then Patricia, then Santiago, and finally Paula. Okay, Stefania, if you have uh, some closing remarks with some concrete tips, sure. oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Luisa. Um, again, I think this may be an uh, unpopular remark given uh, the audience we have here, but if there is one tip that uh, I could give to my colleagues is think of yourselves as business partners and think of the business first and about legal and compliance. Second, make sure that you design products that delight your customers, that make sense, and then figure out how you make um, how you make them compliant, not the other way around. And I think one of the greatest learnings for me at Adi being the general counsel and trying to be a strategic partner for the company and help it grow is think about the business solution first and think about um, compliance second. There's usually a way around this. Of course, I am very fortunate to, to be in a company 
where, uh, where we work and, and stand by the highest ethical standards. So the way why I am comfortable operating like this is because I have confidence that the co-founders and my co-leaders uh, like operate under high ethical standards. But if there's one tip that I could share for, for others lawyers here is don't think that you're the center. Actually, we're here to support the business. Um, and I think it's important not to lose sight of that. That's probably the one takeaway that I would um, like to add here. Perfect. That was amazing, Stefania. Thank you. Pachi, your turn. Yeah, I think what Stefania was actually saying, because I think it's quite key the point that she says we're going to have a lot of development on the regulatory landscape on the next next cycle for business to see how they can adapt uh, either the product or, or when they're developing uh, something new to make, make sure that this is in, in the new regulatory framework because uh, a lot of those rules and regulations can cause because they need uh, more employees to run controls, uh, KYC checks, tools, uh, to monitor certain type of behaviors. So have that in mind uh, when you do your product to, show, to ensure that they're still compatible uh, uh, and will be commercially viable uh, from that point of view. Perfect. Thank you. Santiago, you? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, Stefania. And I, I think that when both the technology industry met with the financial industry, which are two, like, really dynamic industries. They got this uh, crazy off offspring called FinTech, and uh, it requires us as lawyers or compliance officers to be really agile with our decisions and put not only the business in front, but also the user first. We have to make all user-centric decisions at all times, and uh, we really get, um, should get our, our advice to follow the business in order to give the user what it needs and to make them feel uh, secure. We should all remember that the financial industry is an industry based upon trust. So if we can make our users feel comfortable and secure, uh, we are getting really a, a good point uh, towards our, our business success, uh, success. So that's my two cents. I love it. Thank you, Santiago. And Paula, last but not least, <laughs> you. Thank you, Luisa. Well, we should take into account that uh, financial institutions and fintechs are not uh, contradictory services providers. So they should work together. And actually, lots of financial institutions currently have uh, legal departments related to technology, and they should work together. And the challenge we are facing now is providing regulations to be neutral in terms of the use of technology uh, to protect both the financial and economy uh, institutions and, and providers in, in our country, and also to protect consumers and clients, not only regarding the, the data protection services they should include, but also uh, the provision of smaller uh, services that for financial institutions may take more uh, uh, background and, and technology and, and uh, financial terms in order to provide them, such as microcredits and, and other services related to one-to-one -to -one financial services providers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. That was, uh, those are all really great insights. I would also add um, for companies to build a, a multidisciplinary team who can work together fine, who can understand each other, because I think uh, when we're talking about fintechs, about open banking and all and everything that we discuss here, I think it's really nice for people to have like, of course, their expertise, but also be able to understand what everyone is saying. So the legal regulatory, the technical team, everybody working together for uh, a, a nice result. And I really love uh, what Santiago uh, 
brought us uh, about the user uh, centric um, decisions, make the user feel safe, uh, make it um, also, as Stefania said, uh, for us to develop products that delight consumers. I think it's, it's also a very great takeaway because people really, um, they should want to use uh, the technology. And I really don't like when people say that uh, data protection and privacy, uh, they are a burden and now they have to follow in uh, this law, this regulation, oh, come on, lawyers come in here. I don't see it like that. I really don't. I really think that um, privacy data protection, they should all, uh, they should encourage uh, the user to use uh, those technologies because only when they feel safe, they feel secure, they feel like that their data will not be um, misused, they will um, actually use the technology and everything uh, will only be possible to work if we have users actually using the product. So uh, it was really, really, really nice to be here with you today. I really loved our discussions. It's a uh, bad thing is that we have little time, but um, we can uh, discuss maybe later. I really enjoyed talking to you. And well, I guess that's it. Uh, so Stella, I think now it's your turn. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, everyone. Some minutes in order to answer the questions that we have in the chat. Uh, before closing, what do you think? We have two, two questions. From the beginning? Oh, we had two questions. Oh, I thought I thought that they had been answered in the prior panel. They have not? No, I don't think so. I think we, well, I don't know, Mariano, probably. <laughs> they were, Stella. I think those are the same questions that have been answered before. No, I, I, I just keep in mind the questions. Well, probably I am completely devoted to security and I still have not the interest of continue talking on that. Okay, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Marianne. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you both. I think it has been really essential uh, hearing the analysis that you and, and the speakers have uh, made regarding these uh, important uh, issues in our regulation. I just would like to say that uh, from the last panel um, to highlight the following areas. Open finance brings a great opportunity to know more about the customer and giving him a better service as long as, the informa as their information is interconnected. But we have to be conscious about the importance of giving him clear and precise information. Second, higher volumes of data and more circulation among the parties integrating the ecosystem put significant challenges on the table. And finally, working and updating the law and enacting new regulation uh, regarding privacy, since we have great challenges on this field. And I think with this, I, I can also give the floor to Andrea and say, of course, again, thank you to all of you for sharing your knowledge and for your generosity to be with, with us today. Stella, the gratitude actually goes to you for anchoring these, uh, an hour and a half actually that flew literally, as also Luisa said, and certainly to Mariana and Luisa for moderating these two expert panels and to our experts for sharing their views with us. Um, I believe these 90 minutes um, represent actually the soul uh, or the bread and butter of privacy rules. In, in, the, in the panel or in the round table that just closed, um, the speakers actually mentioned how much companies have to assess risks and balance risks against the business strategies, against resources, etc. And this is the spirit of privacy rules. We are an alliance of experts in, in, in nearly 60 countries around the world that are ready to assist um, clients pretty much everywhere where business uh, goes uh, with the three dimensions of our legal experts and you represent the three of them, the three of you actually, that kind of soul that we have in privacy rules, but also cybersecurity experts like Ramon before and crisis communication. Santiago in the last panel was mentioning specifically about um, communications as one of the fundamental components when planning a new business, when putting down strategies for the years to come, how you will address problems and how you will promote that you are compliant. Uh, so 
Uh, I invite again everyone in the audience to, to visit our platforms, to meet our experts, to find the recording of this uh, webinar, um, to find additional details about our next events. We organize constantly events in the Latin American continent and worldwide, of course. And uh, again, thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Obrigado. And uh, be everyone online. And please subscribe to our social media to, to share information free of charge and without any bias next. Thank you. Thank you.